It's always good to start with thoughts of goodwill. Cleans out the mind. There may be issues that come from the day. This person said this, that person did that. You did this, you did that. Things you don't like to think about. And if you don't do a little cleaning up beforehand, it's going to be hard for the mind to settle down. It's like trying to lie down on a bed where there are broken things lying all over the bed. So you clean them off. May all beings be happy, regardless. That, that doesn't mean may they all be happy just the way they are, because that would go against the principle of action, that people find happiness based on their actions. So you're basically wishing may all people act skillfully. May they understand the causes of true happiness and act on those causes. That's something you can wish for anybody, regardless of how bad they've been, how disruptive, how harmful. Try to keep those thoughts in mind and sweep them around the world, because there's enough ill will out there already. You don't have to add any more. At the same time, you want the mind to settle down, to be at peace, find some ease and well-being in the present moment. You want to lift it above the normal, everyday concerns that make it small. We're trying to enlarge the mind here. So awareness can fill the body. And you find as your awareness fills the body, it's running into things that are uncomfortable. So first you want to make sure you've got as many outside issues taken care of as possible, so they don't pull you away. You don't trip over them as you settle down. And then bring that goodwill inside. You're going to try to breathe in a way that feels good, breathe in a way that gives the mind strength. Develop good characters, good qualities in the mind. When we meditate, we're feeding the mind, but at the same time we're exercising it. The mind just feeds, feeds, feeds. Well, that's the image for clinging. You feed off something, but you don't get anything genuine out of it. But as we meditate, we're feeding and exercising the mind at the same time, like putting the mind on a good exercise regimen, getting healthy exercise, getting healthy food. It's going to grow strong. If it's just feeding off of sight, sound, smells, taste, tactile sensations, as we see as we go through the day, there are good ones and there are bad ones. And we, even as we spend so much time running after the pleasant sensations and get as many as we can, we still find that there's something wrong with the mind if it's running around after those things. It lacks strength. It lacks the qualities it needs in order to deal with difficulties. This is why people who are really addicted to pleasure have so much trouble with pain. The least little discomfort arises in body or in mind, and they go for the quick fix. So this is another one of the advantages of having an expansive mind state. It helps see you through a lot of the difficulties. It gives you a good, gives you a good foundation for patience and endurance. The words patience and endurance don't have much glamour. Because we tend to think of them as meaning 
having to put up with something unpleasant and gritting your teeth. But genuine patience comes from a sense of well-being that you can create inside, so that when things are difficult outside, you're not pushed around by them, because you've got something better inside. So the Buddha has you create this sense of well-being and also learn how to think about unpleasant things, unpleasant sensations, unpleasant words. Those are the two things where he recommends patience the most. In terms of unpleasant sensations, you have to reflect on the fact you've got this physical body. The body is made so that it can pick up pleasant sensations, painful sensations. And John Sawat one time said, if you don't believe the body is ready to be pained at any time, just take an iron stake and stick it in the body anywhere at all. It's going to be painful. Of course, the Buddha says, you've got this physical body, and this is the kind of body to which all kinds of painful things can happen. People can hit you, people can throw at you. If you didn't have this body, no one would know where to throw things at you. But here you are, you've got this physical body, and it's a target, not only for people's behavior, but also for all the germs that can come in, all the diseases that can come with the body. So you can't take it personally. This is what everybody's body is like, as long as you're on the human realm. So what are you going to do? You've got to develop the qualities of the mind that enable you to put up with the pain and not feel pained by it. In other words, find something that's deep in the mind, so deep that the pain can't reach there. So solid that it's not moved by pain. You can get to the point where, as a John Lee once said, the words pleasure and pain are things that you speak in jest. They're not that serious for you anymore. Now, the only way you're going to do that is to, on the one hand, develop a really deep sense of well-being inside the mind, and two, learn how to look at the body in impersonal terms, so that when a pain arises you're not developing a narrative around it. In particular, not the narratives that make the pain worse. The same goes with unpleasant words from other people. On the one hand, the Buddha says, remind yourself that on the human level all kinds of speech are spoken. There are kind words and unkind words, words that are meant well and words that are not meant well. True, false, timely, untimely. So when you're the victim of unfair, unkind, untimely speech, it's not that much out of the ordinary. There's that possibility here, and you're running into it right now. That's one way of depersonalizing it. The other way, as he says, you know, unpleasant sound has made contact at the ear. And if you can leave it just at that, you're free from it. But the problem is an unpleasant sound makes contact at the ear, and you think about, well, who said that unpleasant sound, and why are they saying that? Why do they hate me? Why do they dislike me? Whatever. And you're just stabbing yourself again and again and again. So try to depersonalize it. It's just that unpleasant sound making contact at the ear, and that comes and it goes. And that's it. Don't let it reverberate in your head or reverberate in your heart. Don't make it into a gong that just keeps reverberating long after it's been struck.
And here again is a time to spread goodwill. When people say nasty things, do harmful or hurtful things, the Buddha says to spread goodwill. Start with that person. Later on in the tradition, they would say, well, you always have to start with yourself, but sometimes that's not quick enough. You've got to start with that person. May that person be happy. In other words, may that person learn how to act skillfully. They may not be acting skillfully now, and their skillful behavior may come too late for you, but may they someday become skillful in their thoughts, words, and deeds. The Buddha compares this to being a having a mind as expansive as the earth, as expansive and as unaffected by anything as space. Again, that image of the enlarged mind that's not constantly feeding on he did that, and then he did that, and then she did this, and then I didn't, and all whatever. Just let that stuff dissolve away through the well-being of your concentration and through your discernment and learning how to depersonalize things, chop up the stories into little bits. It's when they start connecting, those little bits, when they start connecting, that's when they turn into trouble. And as you do this, you're developing mindfulness and alertness, the strengths you need, so that you don't have to keep feeding on the desire. I want someone to be nice. I want someone to speak kindly to me, to respect me, whatever the issue is. It's when you chop up those little bits that the mind is free to be large. And it's able to endure things and be patient, not because it's trying so hard, but it's learned to be larger than whatever the issues are. <laughs>